Oh, uh, let's see. Okay. Clinical assessment of the feline venal lymphatic disease. So venous insufficiency, and we are going to concentrate on the lower extremities. It affects about 5% of the population in the United States. Women are more likely to have it than men. And the older you are, the more likely you have to develop venous insufficiency. I'm not going to read and repeat all the numbers, I, I, you know. So um, the, li the slides are for me to remember what I need to talk about, not to read one by one, you know. So you can read that at home. So, but I'm going to give the, the important points of each one. Genetics is being debated. What, how, what causes varicose veins? And that standard question of every single patient that I have, what caused this? So the easiest and fastest way to answer is genetics, not only because it's true, but because they see this as no escape and you need to be honest with your patients. If you are gonna do veins in your practice, you need to be honest with your patients. You are not gonna cure these patients. You're never gonna cure them. Genetics, don't promise things you're not, you're not gonna deliver. So in this casuistic here, 42% of patients with, venous in, uh, with varicose veins had at least one parent with history of varicose veins. And 90% both parents. Now, the other answer I have, but nobody in my family has varicose veins. Why do I have these ugly things? Well, sometimes there is autos autosomic dominant, autosomic recessive. You know, they don't need to be manifested in, the, in, in any family. If you have the short straw and you have the two uh, uh, recessive genes, then you're gonna be dominant and you're gonna have it in you. And again, the older the patient, the more likely to have a, a venous insufficiency. Pregnancies, the more times the women get pregnant, the more chances they have venous insufficiency and obesity. There is no turnaround for that. You need to tell the patients in a gentle way that they are obese, you know, that they, you, there is so much you can do for, for the venous insufficiency that they have or symptomatic varicose veins because it has to do with obesity, period. It's not about politically correctness, it's what it is. And then, standing for long periods of time, uh, it's been seen that 36% of the patients um, with varicose veins stand all the time or sitting for peri long periods of time because that's another thing they will tell you. Well, I work sitting, doctor. I'm not standing. I don't stress my legs. You do just by sitting, don't move in the calf pump uh, 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 action. Uh, and previous blood clots. Now, there are symptoms of venous insufficiency that are going to be mild and they are going to be more advanced. The mild symptoms are very vague, as you might understand, and include all this, including heaviness and aching at the end of the day in the morning absent, tightness in the lower leg, and we'll talk about that more. The tightness, tightness and heaviness, we'll address that again in a minute and I'll tell you why. But itching on the skin, that typically is because this, the leg is swollen and the skin stretches and that causes micro cracks in the skin that eventually will irritate the nerve endings and give you itching and, um, and leg, leg cramps at night is typical. Uh, the leg is swollen throughout the day, the muscle is stretched throughout the day, at night you are supine, the pressure starts decreasing, the swelling starts yielding, and then the muscles start relaxing. And what happens when you have a, when you exercise, you can see, you know, and then you have them make a muscle for a long time start twitching and then you end up having a cramp. It's the same mechanism. Uh, advanced venous disease, we are gonna have edema on the lower leg that can reach all the way to the knee, skin dermatitis and venous stasis ulcers. What are the risks of not treating venous insufficiency? You know, address chronic edema, lymphedema, thrombosis and venous stasis ulcers. Now, Classify your patients when you see this. Take the time to classify it because that is going to allow you to follow them to see where, if they improve or not. And the, the basic classification is by the CAP, the, the Clinical Etiology Anatomy and Pathology, pathology uh, Scheme, that is, we are going to go through that in a minute. And then the revised venous clinical severity score. The, the CAP we use mostly the C part, the clinical. Z0 is asymptomatic. Remember this because this is gonna be important, not only for veins, for, I mean for varicose veins, for the, for the cosmetic part, for all the clinical part. 
C0 is asymptomatic, the legs that everybody wants to have. C1 are telangiectasias or reticular veins or the famous spider veins. C2 is true varicose veins. C3 is edema. C4 is divided in A and B. C4A is eczema. Patients that have these skin changes related to venous insufficiency. And C4B is lipodermatosclerosis, which is a very complex disease that is a puzzle. It's a puzzle. When you have patients like that that have severe venous insufficiency, you, of course, take care of the venous insufficiency, but don't promise anything that you are not going to deliver. Be honest with your patients, and they will come back. They will come back to you. C5, active ulcer, and C6, healed ulcer. That's the most important part of that classification. I want to, uh, why? Because at that point, when you are seeing the patient, you really don't know if it's prim primary or secondary. These are, uh, in this classification, you use this later to put the patient somewhere. Uh, or you don't know uh, what part of the, the system is affected, or if it's obstruction of reflux. Of course, unless you, the patient has a history of DBT that comes to you for swelling varicose veins, then you can theorize that it's a mixture, reflux and obstruction. But the venous severity score system was implemented by the American Venous Forum in 2000, and the objective was to give more dynamic evaluation and follow-up to the patients. The question that you're going to find in the boards or whatever is, the, what is the objective of the, you know, the VSS? Well, is to follow more dynamic in the patients. And it's comprised by all these different uh, questionnaires and includes 10, 10 questions with three different levels. And you give a number to your patients, and that allows you to follow clinically your intervention and see if the patient has improved or not. So, and the revision from the previous, uh, the, I'm sorry, the revision was done in 2008, and, and the revision in comparison with the 2000 is gonna be expanded the pain description, the swelling, the uh, anatomy location, et cetera, is more detailed uh, in, in those 10 questions and those three levels that you are gonna put your patients. Now, how do you study your, your, your venous insufficiency patients? Well, in the past, this was the gold standard, the ambulatory venous pressure, it's not anymore because it's invasive, and now we have other uh, tools that can, can give us valid information as well. But basically, we used to put 21 gauge needle in the dorsal vein of the foot, hook it up to a transducer, and measure the pressure. After doing 10 heel raise move maneuvers, one second each, and normally the pressure the, the is less than 30 millimeters of mercury. That's the normal. And recovers within 20 seconds. Based on that, Based on that, then when you have venous insufficiency, you are going to have pressures more than 30 millimeters of mercury, but less than resting pressure. And when there is obstruction and you put the patient to do the, the heel raise, uh, raise movement, then you are going to have extreme pain. Also, venous ulcers never are present with pressures less than 30, and they are always present with pressures more than 90. Now, this was transpolated to another test that we use, but not that often, thanks to the ultrasound, that is the air platysmography. You are going to put this cuff in the patient's lower leg, and you're going to make sure that this has good uh, contact with the skin. You calibrate with 100 millimeters of air, et cetera, et cetera, and you put the patient to several functions. You elevate the, first the patient 45 degrees with the cuff in to empty the leg, and that's going to decrease the pressure. Then you stand the patient, and then you are going to see the blood start collecting in, I mean, obviously the cough start expanding because the blood is collecting and you transpolate the volume and that is the, uh, the, venous, the, the final venous volume, uh, venous volume and with the patient standing. Then you do a heel raise here and that's the ejection volume, go back to rest and then you do it 10 times and that's gonna give you the, the, uh, the residual volume. All these numbers have a function. So the first thing is calculate and again, tenge. Yeah. Okay. Keynote to PowerPoint. Okay. Again, the the uh, the venous filling filling index is the calculation how, of how long does it take for 90% of the of the final venous volume 
90%, how long, in, 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 90 of that in 90% of the time, if that makes sense to you. How long, do, how long, does, it, how long does it take to fill 90% of the, of the time in 90% of the volume? That is gonna give you the Venus filling index and the normal, the, the, the values are less than two is normal, more than two indicates reflux. Somebody in some paper found a large number and decided to say that 2.67 millimeters per second is, a, is the cut of normal. So again, that's what is written there. Maybe somebody like Starling read the Starling principle and said, this is it, and maybe it's not. But for your test, probably, 2.67 is the cutoff for the venous filling, uh, filling index. Now, when you divide the, uh, the ejection volume by the uh, final venous volume, is multiplied by 100, it's gonna give you the ejection fraction. More than 60 normal, less than 40 indicates poor muscle calf function. And finally, if you divide the residual volume by the final venous volume, times 100 is gonna give you the residual volume fraction. So l less than 35% is normal, and this is a, it's a reflection of the ambulatory venous pressure. So you don't have to stick your patients with a needle anymore. This can correlate directly with the ambulatory uh, venous pressure. So it's a test that is not done as often, but it's done more often than the ambulatory venous pressure that you need to know about that. The ultrasound is the gold standard for venous disease, and for reflux study in the legs needs to be done standing or a more than 45 degree angle. If you have patients with venous insufficiency that you send to a vascular lab, and you walk in there just to check how they are taking care of your patient and it's supine, during the whole study, it's useless. You need to put them in an angle or standing. And you need to measure the diameter of the greater saphenous vein, diameter of the lesser saphenous vein. By the way, those are the average values. Diameter of the perforator veins and the depth from the skin. Because if you are planning a treatment, you need to have some depth uh, from the skin if you are gonna do thermal ablation so you don't burn the skin. Now, you're gonna find the smart guy that is gonna tell you, but I can create that space by injecting to medicine and pushing the vein down. Yes, you're right, you can create that space and you can burn that vein, get your money and go home. But guess what, that's gonna be reabsorbed. The vein is gonna come close back to, to the skin and you are gonna have a brown streak along the greater saphenous vein, beautiful. And the patient is gonna be thrilled with you, okay? So that's the difference between you and somebody else. So, the reflux needs to be longer than 500 milliseconds in superficial veins and longer than one second in deep veins. And recently, peak reflux velocity and mean reflux velocity are being used to calculate more accurate parameters that are not in place now to accurately describe uh, the amount and the severity of the reflux in the veins. Because right now, we just know that it's dilated and has one second or three seconds reflux or, or God knows. So, the diameter, oh, that's misspelled, that's not keynote, that's me, okay, that's, that's not keynote, that's me, absolutely me. So, diameter more than 5.5 millimeters, um, the uh, uh, peak reflux volume more than 30 centimeters per second, and the reflux time more than half a second. So, that is going to give you the most accurate criteria for reflux. Lymphedema. The first thing about lymphedema is you need to think about lymphedema, okay? And this is what I was mentioning earlier about the patients that, the young woman that was in a uh, ski accident in Vail and injured her knee, nothing major. Put a cast, crotches, come back, nice and cute, everybody, what happened to you? <laughs> Two months later, she comes to you, referred by your primary care doctor because she has this tightness sensation and swelling sensation, but the leg is normal. And she doesn't know what it is. And you look at her and she has C0, you know, those legs that you saw on, that you saw on the beach, you know, like, the, it's like this one is crazy. You know, I don't have time for this. I'm a vascular surgeon. <laughs> I need to do a thoracic abdominal. Don't waste my time, woman. That can be a stage zero lymphedema, guys. Things, their interstitium and the, and the muscles have the capability of 
harboring 30% of it, their own weight when the fluid is accumulating. And that is golden to treat lymphedema. Granted, there are some patients that are, let's call it difficult to manage, you know? I, I get it, but give the benefit of the doubt and seek more about that patient because that can be lymphedema. Those patients that you say, uh, I don't know what happened. Ask, do you have any fractures, any traumas, any, well, let me give you an example. I have a patient that I was sure had lymphedema. I didn't know how I was gonna demonstrate it, or what was the reason, and I, he was targeting annoyed with me because I kept asking, you know, any history. Well, he's a kickboxer, and he kicked with the right leg, the sack, same place for 20 years. And guess where the lymphedema was, the swelling was? On the right foot. So you need to think about that kind of stuff in those patients, not just see you. So complete physical exam, not just, oh, okay, I look, look fine, yeah, no. Feel the skin, feel the pulses, there is pitting edema or not, etc. Imagine for lymphedema, ultrasound, and we are gonna go through all of this, so I'm not gonna read it, we are gonna go through pictures. Uh, and other by impedance, by impedance, as you know, is the pass of a small electrical current to the body, and it's gonna determine the composition, how much is water, how much is fat, how much is muscle. And then based on the water content, you can start suspecting it might be some lymphedema going on. Volume measurement of the limbs. See which one is more swollen than the other one. Typically, is, there are different criteria, but it's 20% larger than the contralateral limb or about 200 ml in volume. When you calculate, there are specific formulas to do this. Uh, ultrasound. There are two types of edema. Who knows what are the two types of edema? Okay. The epifacial edema above the muscle, that is typical of lymphedema. The through and through edema, all the way beyond the fascia, is for many other reasons, CHF, DVT, whatever. That is the first clue you're gonna find. All this black stuff, for you guys that don't know yet, is, that's, that's, the, that's the edema in the subcutaneous tissue. But you can see also here, in the muscle. So. That's one. Then in a CAT scan and MRI, you can see it. Of course, you need the help with the radiologist here because unless you are really good versed to this kind of stuff, you don't, can separate both of them, but that's edema, and that is edema right here. And then you can have <clears throat> lymphoangiography, which is rarely used now, is the injection of the contrast in between the interdigital spaces in order to do a map of the lymphatics uh, but it's not used anymore for two reasons. It's very painful, and number two, it can aggravate the lymphedema because it's very, uh, irritates the lymphatics. The only reason why this is done nowadays is if you are planning a surgical intervention. That's it, because it has been replaced by the lymphocentigraphy, that is a radionuclide that is detected by the cam gamma camera, and you can make the roadmap pretty similar without all those problems. Now, this is a new technique. It's not FDA approved, but it's coming to your movie theater soon, and is with endocyanin green. This is a fluorescent substance that you inject the same way in between the fingers, and then with a the fluorescent lamp, you can see it in your office. You don't need to go to Gamma, NASA, Space Lab, Chambers, right in your office, and it's very accurate, oh, I'm sorry, it's very accurate to depict the lymphatic fluid. Man, I want to see, it. it's pretty cool. And is virtually painless. You see the lymphatic moving or not? No? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Jeez. So lymphedema is a chronic lifelong disease. This is the patient I told you, stage zero. Had an accident in Cozumel in a motorcycle. Recovered, no problem. Watch her, watch her, teach her. Compression stockings, etc. Stage one is, an edema, is, a, is a clinical stage when you have edema. The edema typically is very similar to the venous edema and CHF and all those kind of stuff, but disappears in the evenings, starts, I mean, in the, in the mornings, gets worse in the, in the evenings. But the difference is there is accumulation of inflammatory substances that is developing fibrosis in the <clears throat> interstitium. So when you do stemmer sign, you will see in a minute, 
is going to be positive in lymphedema. Stemmer's sign is going to be negative in edema. Then stage two, all that fluid creates inflammation that develops scar tissue, and that edema doesn't go. It's the same in the morning that in the evening because it's not water. It's scar tissue. And the last stage is the lymphostatic elephantiasis patients that don't treat themselves. Uh, stemmer sign, when you pinch the dorsum of the second toe, you need to feel, when you go, next time you're in the shower, do it, and you're going to see how the skin touches itself, right? Second toe. In the, in the lymphedema, you can't. You bring, try to bring it together, and there is a chunk of uh, thick tissue in between. That's stemmer sign. Square toes, most likely because the shoe wear and uh, footwear uh, is used, and they are square, uh, almost like a Fred Flintstone. Orange peel skin, typically in breast cancer. Swelling, uh, swelling of the dorsum of the foot, both on the home. I, hyperkeratosis is in thickening of the skin due to the inflammatory changes that is going to look like that. When it keeps going even more and it starts lumping in potato-like lesions, they become papillomatosis. Cutaneous and subcutaneous, I mean, lymphorrhea, any drainage of any fluid through the skin in the absence of any lesion, ulcer, cut, is lymphorrhea. Remember, the etiology is the same. Fibrosis, swe swelling, and hypoplastic concave toenails. And we're going to talk about more lymphedema at the end. I think this is the last talk of this morning for me. Questions?